have a great set of ladies here today and we will get going. Uh, first of all, let's just start with the preliminaries. Uh, this event is brought to you by Strong Women, Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and non-binary authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women, Strange Worlds by visiting our website, and a link will be added in the chat here at some point, uh, but it's um, strongwomenstrangeworlds.weebly.com. So I am your host today. My name is Lauren C. Tepo. I am here uh, coming to you from New Mexico. Uh, I am the author of Implanted, which was my debut. It came out a few years ago. And I have a climate fantasy novella, A Hunger With No Name, coming out uh, next fall from University of Tampa Press. But you're not here for me. You are here for the five amazing women I have the pleasure of introducing. All right. So that should be enough housekeeping, I think, for all of us. Uh, so now the event's going to get started. Uh, here's how it will go. We have scenes from five different real stories to share with you today. Our authors have each written an ending to that scene. Four of the endings will be fake and one will be real. I'll read the scene opening and then each of our panelists will read their version of the ending. And then it'll be up to the audience to decide which is the real one. But beware, our authors will be doing their best to fool you. So listen carefully. All right, so we're gonna get started by introducing the author panelists. And we have uh, with us first, Terry Bruce. Terry Bruce, one of Strong Women Strange Worlds co-founders, writes hard to classify fantasy and science fiction stories that explore the supernatural side of everyday things. She is the author of the Paranormal Contemporary Fantasy Afterlife series, the speculative fiction story collection Souls, and numerous short stories in various anthologies and magazines. Welcome, Terry. Our next speaker is Vanessa McLaren Ray. Vanessa McLaren Ray writes speculative fiction about humans and other people making connections in complex universe. She is the author of the Patchwork Universe series, including All That Was Asked, Shadows of Insurrection, and Flames of Attrition. She often guest hosts for the podcast Small Publishing in a Big Universe. Next up is Anne Nidum. Anne E.G. Nidum has written and illustrated books for all ages. She also makes relief block prints and writes short stories and poems celebrating the wonders of worlds, both real and imaginary. She lives near Boston with the usual sort of family and pets, including a pampered Venus flytrap. Uh, next up, we have Lauren Rhodes. Lauren Rhodes is the co-host with Brian Thomas of a dark urban fantasy duet called As Above, So Below. Her short stories have appeared in Best New Horror, Tales of Evil, Sins of the Sirens, 14 Tales of Dark Desire, and many more. Last but not least is Karen Huff. K.A. Huff is a Canadian writer who balances her passion for exercise and science with her love of cookies and nonsense. She lives with her husband, three energetic kids, and a codependent dog. In her spare time, she writes essays, teaches book boot camps in the parks, and drinks tea. All right, here we go. This will be our first story, and I'll read the beginning of the scene, then each author will read their version, and then um, we will throw it to the audience to see what we have going on. So here we go. Smeared in heavy wet soil, I was digging a trench for the foundation of Haley Annan's greenhouse when someone tapped my shoulder. A vaguely familiar toff stood over me, his fine boots polished to a glow that didn't make sense for the rainy season. He bowed at me, the ditch digger. Sir, he said, I am pleased to say that our mother has agreed to represent you in the tribunal. Who? I squinted at him. Was this one of those failed fosters? Talavanzi, keeper of the Northeast Quarter. So this shiny guy's mother would be one of the preeminent matriarchs of the city. You said our mother. My mother is long dead. And Utec was a widower when he adopted me. His lips pursed in that brand of insults that toffs seem to specialize in. 
My brother's and mine. He lifted an eyebrow in a gesture I suddenly recognized. You're Arnim's brother. All right, so Terry, take it away. You're Arnim's brother. Indeed, he said. That sour lemon sucking look on his face growing deeper. A weighty moment of silence passed between us as he stared at me expectantly, and I stared back. Finally, I said, are you expecting me to say something? He sniffed rather haughtily. I suppose not. Your acceptance of the offered assistance is, of course, assumed. Oh, it is, is it? I shot back. Well, Mr. Fancy Boots, I'll have you know that my acceptance comes with a price. Oh, he said, clearly taken aback. And what might that be? He was so surprised he forgot to sound snooty. I smiled and pointed at the muddy, half-dug ditch in front of us. Finish digging this ditch for me. And then, for good measure, I added, and give me those shiny boots of yours. Thank you, Terry. Vanessa, you're up next. You're Arnon's brother. He pressed a hand to his chest and bowed again. Obsequious snob. He probably couldn't see my skin flushing, what with all the mud. Cut that out. What does Talavancy want? My mother is much taken by your case, sir. She elevated me from a clerkship under her least favored assistant to convey her offer. What would that offer constitute? Lawyers, like doctors, have an irritating habit of assuming everyone understands their arcane, secret-laden jobs. I leaned on the shovel as he yammered about coordinated investigations, witness studies, and enhanced documentation. He seemed oddly sincere. I raised my hand, and he stopped mid-sentence. Who suggested that a high-level matriarch might stand for me in this matter? Again, with a bowing. A person who wishes to see right prevail, sir. I scooped up a shovel full of water and rocks and made as if to toss it at him. Spill it, man. Was it you? Thank you, Vanessa. Anne, what's your take? You're Arnim's brother. He bowed a stiff little bow of acknowledgement. I raised my shovel and started digging again. No, thanks, I said. I'm afraid you don't understand, shiny bloke said, raising his voice and speaking slowly as if I were a fool. You are being offered this opportunity purely out of the public spirited generosity of one of the most respected matriarchs. I stuck the shovel into the mud and leaned an elbow across the top of the handle. No, Arnhem's brother, I think it's you who fails to understand. I know perfectly well what secrets Arnim sold to get himself his recent promotion, and I know perfectly well how he planted the evidence to get me framed for it. Since I'm sure his mother would rather have me found guilty than have the truth come out about her dear eldest boy, I'd rather not have her help at the tribunal. If she wants to see me go down, she'll have to stab me to my face, not in my back. Thank you, Anne. Lauren? He lifted an eyebrow in a gesture I rec suddenly recognized. You're Arnim's brother. He stared at me, puzzled as to how I figured that out. Yes, he said grudgingly. How do you know Arnim and not our mother? I shrugged. He wasn't going to like the answer, so I didn't want to give it to him. Let him ask his brother if he was truly curious. The Toff struggled with his curiosity, piqued that I didn't, didn't give him an answer straight out. Eventually, he fell back on pride and said, you will come meet my mother at the Banshell at nine bells tomorrow in order to discuss your case. I will, I promised. Now, if you'll excuse me, this foundation won't dig itself. He didn't like being dismissed, but he delivered his message and had nothing left to say. He turned on his heel and strutted off. Thank you, Lauren. And Karen, bring us home. Your own in spelling. Benu's eyes widened recognition as well. I leaned my arm onto the handle of my spade and dropped my eyes to his vest, the embroidery marking me for everything I'd already lost. My family crest, or rather what should have been my family crest, had my mother been married to my father, had I not been born a bastard. I could also have been recognized as Arnim's brother. Benu seemed to be getting taller. How odd. A few moments ago, miserable in my trench, but resigned to my lot in life, 
I had been level with his sodden linen-clad chest, and now I was looking at the mud-flaked tops of his fancy boots. Then, with a sickening squelch, the rest of my spade slipped into the muck, and I found myself lying on my side, my tool stuck in the soft clay up to its handle. Perfect. I could have had a future in law. Instead, I was digging a trench, or would be again once I disinterred my spade. Benny extended a fine-gloved hand to me, and I glared at him, then licked my lips and issued a soft whistle, squinting against the drops that fell onto my face. Come now, my good man, he said, arm still extended, voice aggravating in its pleasantness. I have need of your... He paled and shrieked, staggering back from the lip of the trench. I didn't have to look behind me to know why. With a soft thud, Cedric landed close enough that his dragon breath warmed and dried the flecks of mud tightening on my skin. He unfolded his wings a bit to shelter me from the rain. I smiled. All right. That was lovely. Audience, please uh, put into the chat who you think was the original author of that piece. And we'll wait about 30 seconds and then we'll have the grand review. Okay, we have one. Oh, they're coming in. Two for Anne, two for Karen. Another one for Anne. Anne, oh my. Oh my goodness. Karen. Lauren. All right, can the real author please reveal themselves? It's me, that's my book. That's, that's from Flames of Attrition, <laughs> just out this year. <laughs> can you give us just like a log line for your story real quick? Uh, war, fake shamans, real swordsmen, death, and lawyers. Wonderful. Well, that's very exciting. Be sure to check that out. And now, without further ado, we're going to move on to our next story so that we make sure we have time for everybody. All right, so here we go. Chen and Polly could hear Ammon Blank's pacing around just on the other side of the bedroom door. Get the cat, mouthed Chen. Polly nodded and tiptoed swiftly to the wardrobe to grab Uber. But inside the wardrobe, she paused again. What's taking her so long? Chen wondered frantically. Then he heard the magician's footsteps approaching the bedroom door. In a panic, he climbed into the wardrobe beside Polly and pulled the door shut behind him. It was lucky that his finger was still marking the page of the magical door he had chosen as their escape route for the wardrobe was completely dark inside. Now they could hear Mr. Blank entering the room and crossing to his bed. Chen opened his book, felt for the keyhole, and turned the key. A crack of light shone in the dark wardrobe from the edge of the opening page. Polly clutched Uber tightly, and, as quietly as they possibly could, she and Chen crept through the portal. Terry? Polly clutched Uber tightly, and as quietly as they possibly could, she and Chen crept through the portal. They tumbled out of what should have been a wardrobe, but which was really a gate in a wrought iron fence, and fell to the grassy ground in a heap. Chen managed to untangle himself from Polly and jumped to his feet. He looked around, and his mouth dropped open. The wrought iron fence formed a perfect square around what had once been a large building. A house, he assumed, however all that remained now was a large, crumbling pile of rock that had once been the foundation. Oh no, cried Chen, what are we going to do? There's nothing here. What if Blank follows us? He can't, Polly said, trying to calm Uber, who writhed and twisted in her arms like a greased ferret. He doesn't know what door we went through. This is a fine kettle of fish you've gotten us into, Uber snarled and sank his teeth into Polly's finger to emphasize his frustration. Ouch, Polly cried, dropping the cat. Hey, Chen said, you can talk. Uber sat down on his haunches and proceeded to smooth down his must fur. He gave a sniff of disdain. Of course I can talk here. We went through a magical wardrobe. Where did you think we were going to end up? Hobbiton? We're in Narnia, you idiot. Thank you, Terry. Vanessa, what's your take? As quietly as they possibly could, she and Chen crept through the portal. Just as Chen crossed the threshold, a brilliant light flooded around him. Polly let out a shriek and turned as his shadow stretched over her. What's all this then? A harsh voice croaked. A book? I didn't leave no book in here. 
The floor began tilting. Chen pitched forward, stumbling in the glittering passageway. He began sliding faster and faster. Paul, look out! He tumbled directly into her shin, sending her flying. Uber let out a horrific shriek and plunged from her arms. Oh no, Uber, Polly cried as the adventuresome beast vanished into a thicket of green shrubs at the margin of the smooth lawn they'd landed on. Never mind, Paul, he'll be back in a jiffy. Like always, we're safe now. Chen reached into his pocket to summon the magic book through the dimensional twist. But the pocket was empty. He'd lost the key. Oh, my. Anne, what's your take? She and Chen crept through the portal. The moment Chen shut the cover of the book behind them, there was a loud zap and lines of sparking fire shot upwards from floor to ceiling all around them, making a sort of glowing yellowy green cage of lightning. The cat yowled angrily and her tail fluffed out in alarm. When Polly spoke, her voice sounded much calmer than Chen felt. A trap, eh? And a magical one, clearly. What door did you send us through anyway? Who cares what door this was, Chen retorted, hearing his voice wobble, as long as I pick a different one to get us out of here. He opened his book to another page, but when he tried to slip his key into the keyhole, there was a faint buzz, a glow of yellowy green light, and a force that seemed to push back against the key. I can't get it in, he muttered, struggling to push the key toward the page. Stands to reason, Polly said. After all, anyone who can make a magic trap to catch someone with a magic book would know better than to let them use the book to magically escape. All right, Lauren, what's your take? All right. She and Chen crept through the portal. The light was a wonderful, comforting deep green. Chen sprawled on a mat of the softest moss he'd ever felt. Quick, Polly said, close the book. With effort, Chen sat up. He looked around for the book. It lay on a boulder nearby. He could see Ammon Blank's fingers clutching the edge of the portal as he prepared to follow them through. Chen lunged for the book, slapping it shut just in time. The wizard on the other side of the portal roared with anger. Chen sat down on the book to hold it closed. Give me your scarf, he told Polly. We've got to tie it shut. She pulled the scarf from her throat and held it out at arm's length as if she didn't want to get too close to the book or Mr. Blank ever again. Thank you. And Karen, let's hear yours. She and Chen kept, crept through the portal. The musty smell of old books and candles assaulted his nose and his head whirled. As much as Chen usually loved old bookshops, he didn't want to be in one right now. He wanted to be back in his parents' office before they found out what he, what they, had done. Uber struggled out of Polly's grasp, but Chen now was too busy turning in wonder to reprimand her. Shelves upon shelves strided the walls of an oval-shaped room, with balconies, spiral staircases, and rickety-looking ladders placed here and there, all warmly lit by covered sconces. Books stretched up as high as he could see, and, grasping and leaning over a nearby railing, as far down as he could see as well. He leaned back quickly, overcome by a little bit of vertigo and a lot of fear. Forget Mr. Blank, his parents were going to kill him. First, he knew better than to touch any of his parents' collection. His dad had told him not to touch anything in the office, and his mom had shot him an or else look before they dashed out to the meeting. And now he disobeyed them with, of all things, an actual enchanted book, and Polly, and her stupid cat. Secondly, Chen had the department's only bathroom key in his hand. But how is he supposed to have known that it would activate the book's portal? Wonderful. Okay, so we have talking cats, we have broken keys, we have keys to the bathroom. Which one is the real story? Put your answers in the chat and we'll give it about, again, about 30, 40 seconds before we uh, make the grand reveal. All right, so Lauren and Terry, Karen, Terry. Any other guesses here? Another one for Karen. Karen's the one that she does. She goes last. It's always top of mind. <laughs> Vanessa. All right. Well, can the real author please stand up and tell us a little bit about your story? That's me. It's from The Extraordinary Book of Doors, which is a middle grade fantasy about 
uh, book of doors that uh, when you turn the page, you can actually go through the door. And one of the copies of the book had belonged to Benjamin Franklin, who put a treasure hunt in the pages. How exciting. I love I love all these different different takes on things and then the, to find the real stories and the stories behind them. That's really great. All right, we are actually doing okay on time. I don't want to jinx us, but we're just going to keep rolling because we are doing just fine and I want to make sure we get through them all. This is our third of five and we're going to get started right now. Welcome to Oasis, the other self-identification and assimilation system. We understand that the collapsing of two alternate realities into a single time stream, the merge, might be confusing, even frightening. Oasis is here to answer all of your questions and to guide you through this historic event. By this time, most people will have met the version of themselves from the alternate reality, as both realities now occupy the same time space. It is not uncommon to experience a range of emotions upon coming face to face with your other self. Anger, fear, confusion, amusement, even excitement. Who hasn't wondered what if at some point in their life? This unprecedented perk, peak, into an alternate reality provides each of us a unique opportunity to see how things might have turned out if we had made different choices. While not all of these choices will have turned out well, it is an opportunity for each of us to learn a little bit more about ourselves. We encourage you to embrace this opportunity with a spirit of adventure and open-mindedness. However, please refrain from twin switch type practical jokes. They are not amusing. To further explore what those differences may be and how to handle them, please choose a category from the list below. Work and career, family, legal, medical, other. Terry? Please choose a category from the list below. You have chosen family. After the merge, you may notice changes in your spouse's tastes, habits, personal hygiene, or sexual orientation. These changes may lead you to experience some disorientation, even confusion. This is normal. It is important to remember that while your spouse may look the same as before the merge, he or she may have been replaced by his or her other self. It is of the utmost importance that both your their self and your other self meet with your spouse's this self and your spouse's other self as soon as possible to ensure a smooth transition for all involved. Parents, children, and pets should also be included in these post-merge family assimilation planning meetings. If your this self and your other self have similar lives, then the changes your surviving self experiences will be relatively minor. The more different your this self's, there is a chance that your children uh, that your children might not be present after the merge. While we understand how distressing it might be to imagine yourself suddenly married to someone other than your current spouse, or to know there is a possibility that your children will no longer exist after the merge, it is important to remember that, at that point, the children or spouse you remember technically never existed. Thank you, Terry. Vanessa. I was getting into that. Okay, please choose a category from the list below. I say let's go for other, said Susan. Hardly. You never know what you're going to get. Let's stick with family, her twin huffed. She's such a stick in the mud. I don't want to meet family. Okay, other it is. She hit the button before the other woman, who didn't even call herself Susan, could move. As the simulation coalesced, Susan tried for nice. Listen, sorry, I've already forgotten your name. Nah, I'm the same. I keep seeing your face and it's me, just reversed, so my mind fills in Sheila before I can even think. She had a nice smile, actually, once she used it. I went to Australia once, and did you know it's slang for woman? You went to Australia, her gaze drifted. I always wanted to, but then, you know, the thing. Her tone sent shivers down Susan's spine. The thing? Sheila frowned. Shit, now you know why I didn't want to choose other. <laughs> Anne, what's your take? Family. 
There are many complicated issues surrounding the integration or demarcation of other self families, including such difficult questions as, what should I do if I prefer my other self spouse? Or do I have to give birthday presents to my other self's children? But despite these important issues, we have found that in fact, the first question most people ask is, what about my pets? It is important to be aware that household pets, such as dogs and cats, may have a range of reactions to encountering your other self. In some cases, your pets may regard your other self with deep hostility. But in other cases, pets actually cannot distinguish between the two versions of you and may consider you completely interchangeable. If this occurs, we recommend that each version of you select a distinctive scent and wear it at all times until pets learn to identify their own reality's version of you. It is advised that your scent be selected with input from your own family members, lest you drive away your spouse in attempting to retain the affection of your pet. Although if you now prefer your other self spouse, you may not object to that outcome. Thank you, Anne. Lauren? Please choose a category from the list below. Feeling sorry for myself, I chose family. Had my twin married the brat of her reality? Had they surrounded themselves with the four children my Brad said he wanted before his BMW spun out, crashed on the freeway, and ended our dreams? In the photo that opened on the screen, the other Emily was toasting a beautiful woman in a white suit with a flute of champagne. They stood on what looked like a balcony with the Eiffel Tower over their shoulders. Both of them looked radiantly happy, eyes alight with pure joy. Deeply shaken, I closed the window. Other Emily had married my college roommate, Catherine. Catherine never let me know she wasn't straight. What a life we could have had. Thank you, Lauren. Karen. Please choose a category from the list below. Tiana clenched and unclenched her hands, sliding her gaze over to where the other Tiana sat and noticed that she was doing the same thing. Their eyes, identical except the other Tiana had apparently mastered a smokier eye, met, and they both looked away. Remember why you started at this, she told herself, and smoothed down her white lab coat, again seeing the same movement from the corner of her eye on other Tiana's silky red tunic. Hey, other Tiana looked as nervous as Tiana felt. I just, I mean, well, good luck. Good luck? Is she kidding with that? There's only a very small possibility that Tiana, as she knew herself, would survive intact. Almost none. Best case scenario, she'd be herself, but with a different hobby. Worst case, other Tiana would live out the rest of Tiana's life, and Tiana would be wiped from existence. A happy medium, a compromise, would mean that the new Tiana, the Tiana triumphant, would be a mix of both, and thus not either. Good luck indeed. Let's see what we're dealing with here. She reached out a bit into the quick finger, hangnails and all, to hover over the screen. Work and career? Should we start at the very beginning? Other Tiana scratched her chin with one perfectly manicured red nail. A very good place to start, she quoted, agreeing. Tiana gritted her teeth. She loved the sound of music, so it made sense that other Tiana did too. She didn't want to think about it, but it was slowly dawning on her that other Tiana probably thought that she was the original and that Tiana was the other. Moral implications and questions of survival aside, this whole thing was making her head hurt. Thank you, Karen. All right, audience, which version is the real one? This one's going go in almost any direction. So I'm curious to see what we make of it. All right, Terry, Lauren, Terry, Anne, Terry, Terry, Terry. Hmm, are we getting to that point in the, the game where it's easier to uh, figure it out? All right. Will the real author please stand up and tell us a little bit about your story? I didn't fool anybody, I guess. Yeah, that is my story. That's from my short story, Welcome to Oasis, um, which appears in my short story collection, Souls. Um, I wrote that one quite a few years ago. Uh, out of frustration, I was watching the show Fringe, and it was the season where they had the alternate realities in Folivia, and I was like, this is sort of ridiculous plot line. And I also was working for the government at the time and said, if such an event was actually to happen, what would the government's response be? They would, of course, create this very bureaucratic self-help website. And that's how the story was born. I miss Fringe. It was uh, such a good uh, prompt for things to do better. <laughs> um, all right. 
our fourth one is ready to go and we are still on time. So again, thank you to all our panelists uh, for uh, helping us stay on track. All right, here we go. We're going to Mars. Her throat caught and she choked on the mouthful of water. She coughed and hacked, doubled over, her face bright red, tears streaming from her eyes. Mars. Sure, his projects for the past five years have been focused on the effects of microgravity on plants and animals. Sure, he was considered the top biologist in the country, if not the world, on this subject. And sure, space was the next logical step to go, if one was in a science fiction movie. Every two to three years, Grant came home vibrating, and Sarah knew it would be just a matter of waiting till the kids were in bed for him to start talking about the new opportunity, wherever it was. About his work, he was intense, brooding. Everyone was an idiot. Scientists that the world considered brilliant were fools. The breakthroughs he could make with the right equipment, support, funding, the right team. So when he banged in the door at the end of the day, she knew the same thing was happening again. A new job, probably in a new city, usually in a different part of the country. New schools, new house, new friends. Terry, what's your take? New schools, new house, new friends. No, she said, surprising even herself. No, he said, like he'd never heard the word before. Well, actually, that was no surprise. He hadn't ever heard it, not from her. No, she repeated. I don't understand, he said. She shrugged. No. And that seemed to be that. He was too surprised to be angry, too surprised to argue. He just stared, his mouth gaping open and closed like a fish. She stepped around him and went on with what she'd been doing. Will you pass the salt, he asked at breakfast a few days later. No, she said. He stared. She smiled and went on eating. Mom, can I? Their son Joey started to ask one afternoon, barging into her home office. No knocking, no hello, no preamble. She didn't pause, typing. No. But I didn't. No, she said again more firmly. You don't even know? No. She stole a peek from the corner of her eye. He stared at her as if she was some wild creature he'd never encountered and wasn't sure if it was magnificent or terrifying. Maybe both. With this new superpower, she certainly felt like both. Thank you, Terry. Vanessa. New school, new house, new friends, new planet? He was thumping her back, just like him to think that would help. Honey, you okay? Do you need a minute? She shrugged him off. I don't need a minute. I need a year. No, six years. Why can't this wait? We can't put the kids through this again. Seven years of marriage and he'd finally learned to back off when she was mad. Okay, just let me know when you're ready to talk. Now, I'm ready now. Suddenly, everything she hadn't said those other times flew out. The kids <laughs> and their developmental needs. Her career derailed and restarted so many times. When is this ever going to stop? He edged back, retreated to the couch. She waited for him to sit, then took the chair opposite. His voice went soft. It stops here. Here? There, I mean. Mars is the last stop. Honey, it's the chance of a lifetime. We're making a new world. She stared at him, considered the options. Hell no, I won't go. I love how these are shaping up already. <laughs> and you're next. New schools, new house, new friends, unless she flipped the script. With his perpetual habit of assuming himself the smartest person in any room, Grant seemed to have forgotten that Sarah knew a few things herself. But after all, when they'd met at university, she too had been studying extraterrestrial ecology. Sure, he'd head off to Mars for his latest opportunity, but then, then she would put her own plans into action. The next day, Sarah pulled out the box of her own research notes. It was all here, the abiotic components of the Martian environment and its effect on the microbial biomass, the soil horizons and microclimates in the different biomes, the nutrient cycles and their keystone species. She flipped to the blank pages at the end of a notebook and began to make a list of the things she would need to bring. 
Then, once they arrived on Mars, she could take her time and put everything into place because Grant would never notice that she had a project of her own. And when everything was ready, down to the smallest detail, she would take the kids, disappear into the wilderness, and finally be free. Thank you, Anne. Lauren. New schools, new house, new friends. She didn't think she could face it again. When? They're talking about six months. It will give you time to gather what you need to homeschool the kids. Of course, most of what they'll need to study is online. But with the communication lag, you'll want to begin pulling things together now so they don't lose any time. If you keep them busy, there will be less opportunity for them to get into trouble. And Gupta will want to bring her kids too. She's a single mom, so you'll have to teach them also. No. He stared at her. This is the chance of a lifetime. The chance of your lifetime, not mine. Simultaneously, she felt like she was breaking something precious and finally being set free. Thank you, Lauren. Karen, what's your take? New schools, new house, new friends. Same Sarah. Her sidekick skills were well developed. The kids were encouraged to celebrate the time they had with the friends they had made. The new city would be waiting for them with friends yet to be made, activities already signed up for, and tested in two systems for the packing, move, and unpacking. The damn cat always sensed it coming and made life harder than it really needed to be. But off they were going on new adventure. And won't it be great? The places you'll go, the things you'll see, the world beyond the reach of most of your friends. That's where they're going. So when he whistled up the steps into the kitchen this last time, Sarah squeezed her shoulders down and back, took a swallow of water, and turned to tell him he had six minutes till dinner. Oh. Knowing that she'd hear all about this next big thing in a few hours. She could wait that long. Mars. Grant had mentioned joining the Mars colony several times. It had sounded completely surreal the first time he mentioned it, and it hadn't improved over time in retelling as the opportunities crystallized when the first ship landed successfully, then the second. It wasn't just the possibilities that sounded bizarre and unreal, but the one-way journey. A ship made to take off from Earth and land on Mars wasn't made to take off from Mars and land on Earth. She had a ticket to Mars with no return, ever. Thank you, Karen. All right, who has the real take on going to Mars? Put your guesses in the chat. And I like how the, the collective wisdom is like, fuck this. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to curse, but I did anyway. All right, we got a couple for Lauren, Karen, Karen. Oh, we're tied. Oh, no. Oh. Three for Lauren, two for Karen. Anybody else going once, going twice? Anne, okay. Let's see who is the real author of that excerpt. I am, but I have to say that I wish all of you had been there in the writing part because that was awesome. <laughs> like, I was just like, why didn't she say no? Um, so it's from the book Ground Control. Um, it's science fiction, um, clearly. Um, it's Sarah who's followed her husband around for all his career and now they're going to Mars and she has to decide um, if she's going to follow him, if she's not, and how she's going to cope with uh, a big change where there's, there's no going back. So that's that. But I loved all of yours. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Last but not least, we have our final entry. And even though some people who've been paying close attention might know where we're going before we get started, we're still going to uh, see the range of responses to this prompt. So here we go. Lorelei licked the last traces of soul from her lips, then smoothed the knee-length hobble dress over her thighs. The black lycra, I'm sorry. I got a pop up. The black lycra snugged around her like a living creature. The barbed tip of her tail twitched as she scanned the dance club, seeking more prey. Her violet eyes locked on the creature seated at the end of the zinc bar, dressed in a rumpled cocky trench coat. Through the smoke and the flashing lights of the dance club, she saw him for what he was, an angel of melancholy. Hers. His wings weren't manifest, but the unmistakable glow of his halo enforced a margin of emptiness around him. Shoulders hunched over his glass. He was doing his best to ignore what was going on around the club. Clearly not having fun, which is a damn shame, considering that fun was what Lost Angels was all about. 
Lorelai wondered what it would take to put a smile on his face. She patted her she patted hair over the dubs of her horns and adjusted the dress's zipper to be as demure as it could be. The on, only the pale white column of her throat revealed. Terry, take us away. Only the pale white column of her throat revealed. Buy a girl a drink, she asked, settling into the seat beside him. He glanced at her and his mouth turned down. Sure, if there were a girl about, but since you're not one... Oh, come on, be nice. You look like you could use a friend. And you're that friend, he asked, sarcasm dripping from every syllable. For a free drink? Sure. An excited tingle rumbled through her belly. He really was gorgeous up close. His halo was a bronzed gold, his angelic aura creamy white, and the lumps under the back of his trench coat were sizable. Holy hell, but he was delicious all over. He gave her a disinterested shrug but signaled the bartender. A moment later, she was wrapping her fingers around a tumbler full of whiskey. So why the long face, she asked. My car got towed, he said with a sigh. On top of that, my goldfish died. The little cafe on the corner was out of blooming onions. I mean, come on, how can you be out of blooming onions? Is there an onion shortage or something? And the girl I was seeing just wants to be friends. It's not you, she said. Well, if it's not me, then how come? Uh, excuse me, Lorelai said, sliding off her stool. I'm so sorry, but I just saw my friend. I gotta go. She bolted for the door. Once outside, she leaned against the building, sucking in a breath of cool night air. Note to self, she said. Melancholy angel essence might look appetizing, but it's bitter, hard to swallow, and best avoided. Thank you, Terry. Vanessa, you're up. Only the pale white in the column of her throat revealed. A touch to the shoulder of the man lounging beside her target sent the human to the dance floor to perform for lesser beings. Lorelei slipped onto the vacated bar stool, scooching her skirt in a calculated move. The fallen one's eyes remained on his drink. I'll have what he's having, she told the waiting barkeep. The drink appeared in a flash and she proffered a 20, which the barman waved off. On the house, he snickered and moved away. She lifted the glass and sniffed. An odorless gas bubbled through clear fluid. She sipped. Seltzer. No wonder he was depressed. I can recommend some better drinks. I've been here a few times. I know. Oh? He smiled and held out both hands to her, smooth golden palms up, as if offering her a gift. I've been waiting for you, Lorelei. Are you ready to go? Anne, let's hear your take. Uh, she adjusted, adjusted the dress's zipper to be as demure as could be, only the pale white column of her throat revealed. The dress gave a little wriggle of dissent, but she stroked it placatingly along her thigh and it stilled. They walked over to the angel and squeezed in beside him. Lorelai gestured to the barkeeper and ordered a light bringer with a twist, then turned slightly and pretended to notice the angel for the first time. Tough week, she asked in her most sympathetic voice. She had a special talent for the sympathetic voice, and it had served her well for millennia. The angel looked up from his glass and regarded her for a moment with sad eyes. Beautiful sad eyes. The dress dropped its zipper by half an inch, and Lorelei pinched the fabric fiercely behind her back, hoping the angel hadn't noticed. Unfortunately, he looked like the noticing sort. On the other hand, his eyes were on her face, unlike most of the men in the bar. Damn, he had beautiful eyes. So much deceit, he answered solemnly. Even as Lorelei felt a sudden pang of doubt, she could feel the dress laughing. Lauren, let's hear yours. Only the pale white column of her throat revealed. Once she'd made certain that the seams on her stockings were straight and her mortal glamour was flawless, she stepped out of the shadows. Let's see if this one could be one without a fight. The angel ignored her when she leaned across the bar at his elbow, straining the lycra dress just so. Lorelai waved the bartender over. My usual, she said, above the music, and whatever he's drinking, on my tab. When another crown royal appeared in front of him, the angel made no move toward it. Lorelai breathed into his ear. Say thank you. Vaguely, in the bartender's direction, the angel repeated, thank you. 
Lorelai touched her glass against the angels, then downed a good mouthful of her drink, more absolute than cranberry, just the way she liked it. However, the angel continued to ignore her, tense and miserable, wanting his whiskey, but afraid to touch it. Thank you, Lorelai, she prompted. Thank you, Lauren. Karen, let's take your take. Only the pale white column of her throat revealed. Last call, she murmured. She tapped her pointed red nails on the bar top out of time with the beat, her black lined eyes liquid as they assessed the crowd. Her next feed needed to be someone worthwhile, someone to save her. The last one hadn't been satisfying. Her victim had stumbled off, blank eyed, to rejoin her friends who didn't even notice, didn't even notice a difference in her for Lucifer's sake. Lorelai pouted. Where could a nice girl get a proper soul at this hour of night? Buy you a drink? A low voice, almost a growl, shivered in her ear. Her eyes dropped to scuffed, dark brown boots, well-worn jeans that strained over muscular thighs. Then, she inhaled sharply, a slim belted waist that widened out into a strong chest and shoulder combo under that trench coat, stretching the khaki tight with lovely, big, strong arms. She paused her gaze for a second at the hollow in his throat, then his Adam's apple, and, licking her lips again, followed his neck up to a good chin, full lips, and the darkest blue eyes she had ever seen all illuminated by that lonely halo. Her lips curved into a grin. Yes, please. This one was built to satisfy. She could feel it. Thank you, Karen. All right, audience, whose story was that? Let's see. I see some process of elimination in the chat here. Excellent. All right. Can we have the real author reveal themselves, please? It's me. Well, I, I, you all understood the assignment perfectly. <laughs> that was great. Um, that's the, the first scene of my book, Lost Angels, uh, about a succubus who falls for an angel and he promptly turns around and possesses her with a mortal girl's soul. So it's a, a love triangle between the three of them. That sounds awesome. All right. Well, uh, we did this in time, which I, I don't know if the audience can appreciate, but uh, it takes talent to not only address each of these prompts in such a variety of ways, but to do it on time uh, is also pretty darn impressive. So please welcome me in uh, celebrating all our authors here today and their stories. Uh, it was really, really a lot of fun.